All right, thank you. Check, hello, cool, hi. Hello, thanks a lot for coming. My name is Stephen Henry Biscup. I am the creative director of a company called Liquid Development in uh, the United States. And we're a production company and we did um, something in all of those videos that you just saw, various assets and pieces of art. I'm gonna talk today about working as an artist in the video game industry and um, I really think that the core of what it is, the job is to find the awesome all day long. That's how I could kind of summarize what it is for me to work as an artist in the video game industry. And that's why I named that. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about who I am, um, what is the awesome, what do I mean when I say the awesome, uh, what is the trajectory of awesomeness in video games uh, that we see, um, what is liquid development? A little bit more about what liquid development is. The role of traditional art skills in doing game art. Uh, the software and training that is really important for game art and how you can get started working as an artist in video games. Um, when Plus some of the coolest new technology that we're using today in video games. So who am I? My name is Stefan Henry Biscup, as I said before. I've been an artist since I was a little kid. I love to draw. I was really excited about art. Um, later, uh, I got a degree in art in 1989. I'm old, it's true. Um, and uh, after I finished that, I went to school to learn about computer games a couple years later. Uh, and at that time, really the big buzz was virtual reality. I know we're all hearing about virtual reality now, but that in the early 90s, Video games kind of didn't really exist. They were only 2D things like Sega and stuff. 3D, in particular, in video games, had not really come to be yet. Uh, and then um, I started working in architectural pre-visualization because that's where I was learning 3D and I was interested in that and that's where it was applicable. But a guy came to our school one day and spoke about getting a job in the video game industry. And I just thought, wow, that sounds really cool, really interesting. I want to learn about that. And I'm really glad I did, because that was a long time ago, and I'm still doing it to this day. So my first job I got was in 1992. Now, here's some of the things that turned me on when I was a little kid that I think, when I thought back about working as an artist in video games, I think all these things really play into it. Like at Disneyland, the animatronics and the special effects. When I was a little kid, I used to actually make fake haunted houses for my parents to come through, like we'd tie strings to the top of the door and get yank on it slowly so it looked like a ghost was opening the door and stuff like that. And I thought that was totally amazing. It was so much fun. I was totally inspired by all this stuff. Um, and then also Godzilla movies. Like the greatest thing about Godzilla movies was the little buildings. Right before they stomped on them, they'd show you this beautiful shot of these amazing miniatures, a lot like you see in model trains and stuff like that. And I found that completely fascinating. I was very interested in learning how to make stuff like that. Monster makeup, watching people show specials about how they would mold pieces and glue it onto the faces and everything and put together these really amazing effects, I thought was really fascinating. Um, I'm too far from the thing. There we go. And surrealism. So, Artists like Dali and Magritte especially uh, were really cool to me because look at how realistic these paintings are. This is like super realism. They're painting something that's fantastic and imaginary, but yet it's believable. And so the illusion and the fantasy was that much stronger. Now I think that all of those things are totally what game art is about. Game art is about special effects. It's about fantasy. It's about cool little buildings and everything that's involved that was fascinating about those things I believe are involved in making game art so I feel pretty lucky that game art started to really take off when I uh, got out of college um, so what is the awesome let's talk a little bit more about that so the awesome makes you say wow something that's awesome you are just like oh my god I can't believe that I never imagined that something like that was possible um, it is something that's compelling it makes you want to make something at least that's the way it is for me. When I see some incredible new Uncharted 4 or something like that, I really want to go work on making characters that look that cool or environments that are that rich. Uh, it is also, uh, well, it's compelling in that it makes me want to see more, and it's inspiring in that it makes me want to make stuff myself. Um, it's also working in video games when you, or in any art, when you do something a little bit better than you did it the day before. Because if you're an artist, how many people here are actually artists? Right, so it, we work really hard to try and get good at what we're doing. And every time that we know we've gotten a little bit better, 
that feels awesome. And that's part of the job, is to kind of just keep growing your skills as you're working, because that's the way it happens. Um, and so working as an artist in video games lets you tap into all of these things, and that's why I think that to be an, idiot, an artist in the video games is to be finding the awesome. So why am I talking to you here today? Why did I bother to come and tell you all of this stuff? First of all, it's because I've been doing this for 24 years, and I still love it. I still find it completely inspiring and exciting. The things that I felt when I was at Disneyland as a little kid, I feel now when I'm playing with ZBrush or 3DS Max or Unreal. You know, it's totally awesome. It's, that's just, there's no other way to put it. And it's really fun. It's really interesting to build things and put it all together, to work with all the people that it takes to put a video game together and to create these things. So, you know, I want to help you, encourage you, that there's a lot of artists that are needed. There's a lot of art that's needed in these games, and I'm here to kind of hopefully give you some benefit of my experience if you're interested in doing this and help you understand where best to focus to be able to do this well. Okay, so the art in video games is awesome. I've said that already. We've talked about it, but, you know, really specifically, the art is one of the ways that people show off the new power of the machines. I mean, if you think about it, when you go to see an E3 video unveiling the latest PS4 stuff, it's all about the art, really. I mean, the gameplay is great, and that's very cool, and it's absolutely critical that gameplay be there so you're not just looking at pretty pictures because it'll get boring. But the art is one of the most powerful things about games, and it is constantly required that people who are making games come up with awesome art. It's re you, you, there's, the audience demands it. There's really no way around it. It's required to be successful. So let's talk a little bit about the way that things have changed over time. Because they've changed a lot. And you know, as I said, when I first started, real-time 3D didn't really even exist in video games here and there. Um, and it was, it was pretty amazing when it did. And then amazing things happened. There's a lot of times in my career when I thought, well, that's about it. There's no way that we can get any more powerful graphics. There's no way we can get more polygons on the scene or more simulations. It's, it's just impossible. And I was proven wrong over and over and over again. And I, so now I don't doubt that I will continue to be proven wrong. And the quality of art and the amount of detail that can be there is only going to keep getting bigger. And that's great, because if you make art, you need a job. And there it is. There's a great opportunity to make jobs. So going specifically to a case study about that. In 1994, there was a game put out by a studio called Bullfrog that was started by a guy named Peter Molyneux. He was the one who later made the Fable series. Very famous game. And this was called Magic Carpet. And in Magic Carpet, you would fly around in an air balloon and throw mana on the ground and make cities pop up. It was like a city building game. But the really amazing thing about it was that it was a real-time 3D game. So when you threw stuff on the ground, the city would rise out of the ground, and it was mind-blowing. It was considered very high-end. It ran on the brand new Pentium chips that were out there, and it was really a point of pride of the developers of how am amazing these graphics were. And so this is what the 3D cities looked like in Magic Carpet. And this was amazing. This was incredible. In Magic Carpet, they had particles that you could throw on the ground that would bounce around, and that was amazing. And they had these real-time reflections in the water. And they had these really cool monsters that you could fight, and it was magical. And this is what landscape is like in video games today. Amazing, right? I mean, really amazing, especially when you see it in light of what was considered to be the most incredible art of the time. And now, this is what buildings look like in video games today. And you can go explore that entire city. You can walk around. You can go inside those buildings, all of them, and see all these people walking down the street with extremely detailed costumes. I mean, you guys all know this. You've played these games. But it's worth noting what a leap this is in just 24 years. Oops. They're crazy cool creatures to see in video games today. This is from Horizon, one of the new games on the PS4. And, you know, they married dinosaurs and robots together. And it sounds uh, maybe obvious, but they did it in a really special way. I mean, it's magical. It's incredible. It is totally awesome. It's totally beyond what I thought was possible. It expanded my mind of ideas. And so I think it's, it's really great. So there we go. This is then versus now. It's really changed a lot. It's really significant. And um, 
So, you know, these worlds are very detailed. You can imagine going out into this city. This is from Watch Dogs 2. You know, it's a huge open sandbox world. It's got intense detail all over the entire thing. Somebody has to make all of this art. So video games need a lot of art. Games need tons of characters and props and vehicles and environments and monsters and effects and animations to fill out the experiences demanded by characters today. There, isn't, there is art in every part of a game. Effectively, games are art, right? You walk around this world and you experience it, and the nature of the art that's putting this game together creates the entire sort of being of the game, the character of it, the personality. It shapes it. And so this means that the industry needs a lot of people to make this art. So Liquid Development is a studio that makes art. And uh, we were started in the year 2000 in Portland, Oregon. And we joined Keywords International, a larger studio of which Kite Team is a part, um, in 2015. We have an in-house staff of 60 people, but we also work with freelance contractors all over the world who can connect with us virtually. We have an online system for communicating with those artists. And it's possible to work from anywhere. It's possible to work from Mexico. And, um, that's how we increase our staff as necessary for the size of the projects that we need and the types of work that we need in those projects. So here are some of our clients that we've worked with and the games that we've contributed to. Um, and we do all of the art for video games. Uh, and I'm just going to go over a few of the things. Um, no coding, though, no game development. It's all totally art creation, some like uh, technical art for scripting and things like that. So we do rough concepts where we're dreaming what things are going to be. We do final concepts where we really design something out as we want it to be built. Hard surface assets, organic assets, things that are living. Specifically, we do a lot of 3D characters. Characters is kind of the area that I focus in. I direct those projects a lot. So some of my examples are going to be pretty character specific uh, as we talk about some of the art skills and things creatures, monsters, things like that for the games, vehicles, anything you're going to ride in or fly in or drive around the game. You've got to have guns if you're making a video game, at least some of them, at least most of them. And so we make a lot of guns. And, um, and then also the prop, uh, the world building modular parts. When you're making a game level, it's generally made out of sections that get put together to fill out and complete a world. It's important for memory and um, uh, requirements to fit on the systems. And then the set decoration, we do a lot of the populating of the sets with all of the assets that we've made to complete them and make them fully believable. We do the lighting to give it a nice dramatic feeling and compose it all together a lot of times to direct the player through the gameplay. And then character rigging, a really important principle that we work about with characters is that we are making puppets, not sculptures. So it's really interesting to sculpt a character and put lots of detail in it, but it's really critical that when it moves in the game that it stays together. It has coherent and, and proper proportions and bends in the right places. I've got an interesting example about that coming up. And then we do a lot of motion capture and uh, keyframe animation. Motion capture, we don't have a studio. We generally work with uh, motion capture data, though, to complete it as viable uh, data for the systems. Okay, so at Liquid Development, we do a lot of art, and that's really important. But we also focus very much on the production of the art, the process of communicating with the client and effectively making what they want accurately. And these are all really good principles uh, to follow working as an artist yourself. It's interesting in that the way we relate to our clients, it's really important. We understand it's pretty much the same as being an artist individually working on stuff. And so, you know, diligence is really critical. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into some art skills things. But transparency, it's really critical that we don't try to cover up and tell the client, ah, everything's going fine. You know, it's great. When something's wrong, we talk about it. And we deal with it openly, and then we fix it. And you can work through anything that you talk about. And that's a really, really important thing to know. Excellence in our work is obvious. I mean, we have to do really high quality work, but it has to be high quality artistically as well as technically. And there's a big part of technical within computer art. Um, and we have to listen to our clients, be accurate and consistent. And so as I said, these are all valid for you as an artist as well. These are things to keep in mind that are really critical for you to be successful. Okay, so how do we make that communication effectively work 
either between us and the client or between the artists and ourselves. And the way that we do that is we have an online production system that we call the pit crew. And this is just a communication medium, but it allows us to really talk about everything in a very effective way that can yield you know, results that make sense. It's really important when you're working as an artist that you understand specifically what you need to do. It's very hard to be in a position where you feel like you're guessing, like, I don't know, really, what do they want? How should I do this and stuff? I mean, that sucks if you're an artist. It's, it's no fun. And so we really dedicate a lot of time to communicating effectively to the artists and giving them the information that they need so they can build things accurately. And we do that. It's a pretty simple system, though. It's just a thread that started, just like any community that you might subscribe to online and do discussions. And that starts then with the concept of a model that we're going to create, maybe information about the way it's set up. And then the artist starts posting their work in progress. It shows up as thumbnails like this so that it's not too huge. But if you click on one of those, it can become a detailed screenshot showing the work as the artist is doing this. We also have an FTP hooked up to it so that we can send files back and forth and look at things in a way that isn't necessarily viable just by looking at pictures. And we talk to people directly through IM and stuff like that, Skype, whatever is necessary to be able to communicate effectively. Communication is really really critical, no matter how much art skill you bring to the situation, if you're not communicating, you don't get a chance to use that art skill as effectively as you might. Um, and then there's comments that go up that come back from us talking about the way things need to be changed. There could be comments from the client themselves. So as we're working, the client is seeing all of this work going on. And a really important thing about this is that as we say, well, we're going to deal with the stitching in this way on a leg or something like that, all the other artists who are working on other characters can see this. And so they learn what the rules are about the way the art should be done. And this allows us to ensure consistency across all of the artists that are working on it. And, you know, it keeps on going until finally we hit the finished product. And so that's it. You know, but it's, it's amazing how effective it can be when everybody comes to the table and brings those kind of behaviors that we talked about uh, to the communication. Okay, so, spaceship. What? Everybody here just got a picture in their mind. But if we could see that picture, everybody's picture would be different. Could it be that this is the spaceship? Everybody's going to have a different idea of what's in their mind. So a word can mean a lot of different things to different people. And what we're trying to do when we make art is take ideas and make them into, you know, something final. There's even you know, spaceships that are very different from what we typically see in video games. There's spaceships that are archetypes that work in specific games or specific worlds and they belong together and some that don't belong in that world. So what's really important is to draw a picture and this gives us something, we communicate in pictures. This is how we effectively go from an idea to something that we can actually talk about, okay, how are we going to build this? And um, images are universal and objective. We can look at it, and as we're making something, we've got a ready, referenceable thing, like, is this model going well? You know, no, it doesn't have the right curve. It feels a little fat here. It feels a little skinny there, whatever. So it's really important that we're able to visually present the idea that we have in a way that everybody can see and continue to work from to be effective. So there's photos of things in the real world, that's great, but there's no photo of your imagination. So the degree, that, the ability that you have to create a, a strong vision of your ideas is going to be the degree to which your idea actually comes to life. So your skills are the filter of your imagination. Your art skills are the thing that your ideas are going to pass through. And it's either going to make it through successfully or it's going to be blocked by maybe your ability difficulty with being able to render things if effectively. The skills and the, you know, the basic skills, drawing is the ground zero skill. And then perspective, proportion, color and composition are important ones. There's a lot more than this, anatomy, and there's a lot of detail we can get into. But for the sake of this discussion, we're just sticking to these basic ones. But these not only um, allow you to create things well, they guide your understanding of the subject. So when you're looking at something and you want to make a piece of art from it, like if somebody gave you that spaceship and you were supposed to model it, being able to break it down and understand the detail effectively and start to model it in 3D, your background and being able to understand and kind of look at proportion and perspective and things like that is going to greatly affect how well you're able to do that, how much of a chore it is or how effective you are at it. 
um, the truth of these foundations does not fade. These things are, I'm talking about basic art skills that have been around since the Renaissance, and they're completely relevant today. Technology is amazing. I love working with computers. I love the undo button. I love the amazing facility that it gives me. But there's no amazing technology that can make up for poor foundations. The, poor, the great foundations will lift your computer art up. But if you don't have those foundations, it'll be a struggle. And um, you know, there's a lot of times that we'll see work that has great detail all over it. But if the anatomy isn't strong, then you find yourself stopped from ex getting into that character and getting into the story that they're supposed to be a part of because you're kind of stopped by how things look awkward or off. Okay, so going through what some of these core skills are, these are the things that you really want to make sure that you drill on to get good at. Core forms, everything is made out of a cube, a sphere, or a cylinder. Uh, in 2D, it's a circle, a square, or a triangle. Um, and you can see here how more complex things like the human body can be broken down into forms and understood more effectively through this. Uh, it's also the ability to rotate those things in space, like this stack of heads that are there. And the way that you learn how to rotate things in space really effectively is by understanding perspective. You know, these are not really that hard. I think a lot of us have seen this in lots of art books that we've seen. But when it comes down to actually doing it, it just, it just takes work. And it's worth spending the time doing it. And that's kind of the point of what I'm trying to say. So proportion is another one that's really important. So here's a really famous and beautiful painting called Ingr um, Odalesque by uh, Ingres. It's a beautiful painting, right? But if we compare this painting to a real person, there's something kind of strange that becomes apparent if we pop back and forth between them. She's actually got a really long torso, right? From her hips to her shoulders. It's actually kind of weird. Now, it's fine in this 2D painting because she's counterbalanced by the curtain on the left. And it makes it all hang together and we focus on how beautiful the painting is and the rendering is beautiful and the color and the lighting and all that stuff. But now if we took a real world person that we wanted to put into a game or if we made a model that needed to get up and walk around and we gave it those proportions, it would not really feel right. You know, and that's the thing is that it's in 2D it looks great. Standing still a model look, might look good. But remember, we make puppets, not sculptures. So they need to be able to move into the world and maintain that engaging believability so that we can dig what we're seeing. Color theory is very, very important. It's a very ground level skill that can help you make effective images. Um, and then, you know, color harmony. This talks about the ways in which certain colors go together effectively. Composition is about how to build a solid image that is balanced and works well. And this is also beneficial in 3D because when you talk about looking at the weight of you know, somebody's boots compared to their legs and making sure that everything feels coherent together, this is a, a really important um, skill to understand. So let's say you know, you've worked a lot at your skills to be able to draw well and things like that. The next part is you need to bring your eye. You need to bring your mind. You need to bring your perception to the subjects that you're going to make. Your observation, you're going to see the subject accurately, and this informs all of your other skills. Your eye meets your hand when you create. And um, you really want to use re reference. Don't be ashamed to use reference. I have lots of reference. It's a critical part of making things right. I once worked on a game where there was a zombie coming down the hall towards you, and he was reaching right at the camera, so it was like foreshortening, which can be really hard. And I was drawing it and drawing it and drawing it and drawing it, and it never looked right. And I just felt stupid and frustrated. And I finally went across the hall, and I got this programmer, and I told him, just stand like this. And he looked at it, and I sketched it, and I got it. And then I went back and it was fine and I was able to go forward. So reference is really, really important. It helps you be effective at what you're doing. Um, and so, uh, you know, and you got to be ruthlessly honest with yourself. You got to know if it's looking right or if it's not. And it can be hard sometimes because it takes a lot of work. But if you stick with it, this is how you grow, just improving a little bit at a time. So details make character. This is a really important concept because it shows how, you know, these art skills uh, can seem a little dry. They can seem a little bit like exercises and things like that. But the way in which they actually become foundations that make your work more alive and successful uh, is here. So 
think about, we hear character art all the time. Oh, there's these great characters in this game. There's this fighting game with these killer characters. Character, character, character. But have we thought very much about where that word comes from? It comes from characteristics. It's the how your subject is uniquely themselves. The way in which they are different from the generic model. And so here's a very generic way of drawing a human head. This is a standard art school formula for building a head that feels believable. That when you see it, you're going to not go like, wow, that is strange. I don't understand why. But you buy it, and you're going to go into it. And then, but the result is very generic. It's, it's, you know, it doesn't look like anyone real, or it only looks like you know, TV models or something. Here's an example of four different heads, all of which are using those base proportion formulas, but in the ways that they are unique from the standard model, they gain unique personality. And that's the way we all are. None of us look like that generic guy, although all of us do have our eyes pretty much in the middle of the head. And all of our eyes are pretty much one eyes width apart, and all the other rules that exist. And it can be interesting for many of the character projects that we do. We use photos of uh, different people. And stars you know, are easy to find a lot of photos of. There's tons of them on the internet. But we also will oftentimes have to be very careful. We can't use a real likeness of a person because then we can have to pay somebody a bunch of money or sometimes they will get upset because it looks too much like them. So a lot of times we're taking the traits of different actors that we feel are right and merging them together into one person. And that's where stuff like this helps us check ourselves and make sure that we're maintaining, because it might start to get weird looking as we bring those together. And this helps us check ourselves and make sure that we're effectively creating a character that's going to be believable and successful. So again, with observation, here's another good example about realistic versus symbolic. A lot of times things in our mind are, we, un we think we know what they are. And we start to draw, and we may not realize we're making more of a symbol than an accurate portrayal of the subject. In this example here, there's an eye, but it's really very symbolic. It misses many of the details that are what actually look like when we look at a human eye. So a real human eye has a more oblong shape to it. There's a tear duct. And the iris doesn't sit symmetrically in the center of it. And so here you can see we've already broken past the symbolic kind of barrier into something that's more realistic and that fits what, a real, what the subject really looks like. And that's this particular eye. Different eyes have different characteristics of these parts. But it gives an example about how important the detail is. So here's another uh, topic about detail with props a lot. You know, scratches and grease and, and the gunk collecting on things and, and all that kind of stuff is big deal when we're making video games, uh, art. You know, all, everything we make has scratches on it and it's worn and it's got a story, it's got a history to it. And you'll notice that, you know, these scratches on the, uh, I don't know how to use this thing, the scratches here are on the edges of things, they're not in the middle. And so there's a logic to this stuff. There's a history that's there. And if you put all those things in the wrong areas, it would seem weird and it wouldn't feel effective. But if you start to think about it this way, it becomes kind of obvious where those things ought to go. And so it's, it's, it's more easy to make that work. And so here's an example of a gun from a game that we did. And you can see you know, the scratches are all in the exposed places and gunk is collected in the crevices and the, the nooks and crannies. So as I said, reference. Reference is really important. This is my reference folder. And if you look at the little scroll bar up in the corner, you can see how tiny it is. This is just folder after folder after folder of stuff that I collect all the time that I just keep putting in there. Either I'm looking for something specific, or maybe I get off on you know, a, a tangent looking at a particular artist or something like that. And um, so these are some of the places that I like to go. Pinterest has become a really amazing resource for, uh, for reference, because there's other people out there collecting a lot of stuff together. I used Google Image for a long time, and then I discovered Pinterest. And it's really effective. Now, there is a document that I made that has links for a bunch of the sites and things that I'm referring to that Raimundo, the uh, guy who's running the stage, is going to be able to get to you if you sign up with him. He can email it to you. And it's, you know, I don't think a lot of this stuff is probably stuff you guys don't know about at some level. But if you'd like, I put that together. Because it's really, really important. It's really beneficial to find good reference. A lot of times you can kind of get lost while you're trying to figure out why something doesn't look right. And good reference could really help. Um, okay. So training resources. Make art. Your greatest training resource, whatever, is to make art. There is no substitute for actually doing the art. 
When you make the art, you learn the most. You, you know, doing is learning. When you, get to, you, in, when you do it, you get to know what the lessons were telling you in a way that's truly unique. Huh? Okay, good, cool. Um, and then there's, okay, school, online, and books. So about schools. We do not hire people based upon their schools. We hire people based upon their portfolios. But school does give you a lot to do. And school does give you a great structure in which to do that working that's necessary to really get your skills together. So school isn't required. What is required is having those skills and being able to do art at the level that we need. And school can be a very effective way to make yourself practice. If you're, not like, if you're like me and you're kind of procrastinate, you don't practice as much as you should, school's a big help in making me keep trying. Um, and you want a school that makes you work a lot? You want a school that works a lot on these foundations that we've talked about. Um, and you want a school that understands that training is the doorway that you must pass through to get to personal expression. Online, there are many, many great online resources. You guys are really lucky in this time to have so many things available. The internet has really given us an opportunity that's phenomenal and unique. School used to be a lot more important because we didn't have the internet to get this information dispersed. Um, there, and these are just, this is just a fantastic, this list is a great list and those um, are all in that document that I was talking about that you can do. And these are all things that I've actually used. And then books, uh, these are four books I like. The thing I've found about books is I tend to focus on one thing I'm trying to understand, like how the knuckles fit together on a hand. And I'll just go pour over all the books in the store until I find one that speaks to the subject I'm thinking about. And usually if it covers it well, it covers the other stuff well, and I've got a book that helps me on the whole. And I just have built my whole library. I have many, many, many books, and this is how I've built it, just kind of following the breadcrumbs to the different subjects that I'm interested in. Okay, so this is probably the most important slide in the entire talk. Okay, practice, practice, and more practice. There is no substitute for practice. I tell people it's ass in the seat time. That's what matters most of all. Um, you know, and, and you c but at the same time, you can rely on practice. So there's this idea perhaps that you either have it or you don't with art. And you may know some things intuitively. That's true. You may have a flair or an ability to draw people or do certain things, but you don't, aren't going to know everything. And you can learn the rest of it through practice. And you can trust in practice. And that's a really important thing because sometimes it can seem like a lot of work that's frustrating and a chore. But that's what I'm trying to say is it's really worth it. Um, so, you know, the most important thing really is diligent persistence to keep going back and keep working because uh, it can take a while at first. And I tend to not work on the things that are harder for me, and I have to learn to work on that more. Okay, fail and learn. So I have failed many times. Liquid development failed many times. Games have failed many times. How many amazing games have you been so excited about in all the previews, and then the game comes out, and it stinks? You know, it's true. It's really hard to make a game. And it's kind of, that's why when somebody does make a game that's really great, it's that much more spectacular and awesome. Uh, you will fail. And it's fine. It's not failure if you learn from it. Then it's just life. And that's okay. So welcome failure because it's your opportunity to understand where you need to work harder and how you can get better. It gives you really clear direction. So, you know, and, and that's it, really. Y you getting a little better every day is how we actually grow. It's great to be inspired by the awesome artists on ZBrush Central and ArtStation and DeviantArt and PolyCount. Those guys make me excited. That's the awesome, right? They make me want to work. And a lot of them, they do things I'm, I'm kind of, I feel, you know, it, I'll never do it. Uh, but. Uh, what I can do every day is, as long as I know I've gotten a little better than myself, then I keep going. And that's what you can do too. And that is what actually happens. That's the way everything in life actually grows, literally. Okay, so 
let's say you've worked a lot, you've gotten your stuff together, and now you want to make a portfolio. So here's what you need to know about making a portfolio and what the people who are getting them are going to be thinking as they look at them. First of all, keep it simple. Show the work. We don't need a lot of different pages. We don't need a lot of different avenues to it. Um, show finished work. Show less good finished work than more partially finished work. Because it is in, it's getting the artwork all the way to the end that really matters when we're making work for a client. So it doesn't matter that you've got tons of work. What matters is that the work you've got is of good quality and that it's complete. Um, pictures versus videos. It's better to have pictures. This is my personal preference over video, especially for modeling portfolios. Um, I'd rather just be able to look at pictures. I can go through, get to those as, as fast as I want. Unless, of course, you're doing animation, in which video is totally relevant. Uh, Real-time 3D preview is pretty cool. It's new. Uh, it works really well with some of the options that are out there. That's a good, that's a good thing. Um, but your goal is to get us to call you back, right? That's all that matters. We're going to understand a lot about you by what's in your work. Your work is going to say about your level of dedication to detail and things like that. And we'll get to know you as we talk to you in person and have interviews. And so, uh, you know, this art station, I think, is a really good example of, of a nice portfolio structure. I find it to be really effective. So getting the job, you want to prepare yourself. And um, OK, I want to prepare yourself, uh, as we talked about. But don't wait to be perfect, because you're going to continue learning throughout your life. You know, just you want to make sure that you're solid. Now, a really good way to do this is to get involved with the online forums, like PolyCount and ArtStation and things like that, where you share your work and get feedback and things like that. Every company is really looking for people. They've all got job pages. You should feel you should go for contacting the companies you want to work for, the company whose work is making you excited. Because they may not have the job you're looking for listed on their website, but contact them through the email, and if your work is strong, they will get back to you. You know, be bold, do it. What about keeping the job? Whether you're working in-house or as a freelance person, this is pretty simple. It's not that complex, but it really bears worth, it's worth saying. Be nice, be nice. This is a business where a lot of people are working really, really hard. And it can be easy and to, to get under stress. It can be easy to get short. And ultimately, that is not professional. You want to be professional when you're working with people. Take it really seriously. You show people a lot of respect when you, res when you take the work very seriously with them. Be honest. Ask questions. Don't be afraid that, to say that you don't know something. Good people are going to share the best practices. They're going to help you, and they're going to want everybody to be successful together. Follow feedback from your art managers. It kind of goes without saying, but it's really important because you're working in the context of a much larger project, and they really need you to help them make everything effective. Uh, you know, cultivate time management skills. That's a big one. It's easy to while away the hours and, and uh, you know, try to work at work and have fun at home. It's easy to change that. And it can be a really benefit to think about that. Uh, stay connected. Keep your managers updated. And don't worry about showing works in progress, especially if you're working with somebody remotely, because you really want to avoid going into the wrong path. There's ways that you're going to be interpreting something from a drawing. And it's much easier to just talk with your art manager and make sure that you're going the right way. Um, and, and Everybody's fine who's really doing the work with seeing a partially completed thing. You don't have to worry until it looks so cool. OK, so let's just get in here towards the end, and we're wrapping up. And I wanted to just talk really quickly about some of the really cool new technology that we're using to make art for video games. So um, and we're going to go over that. And all of these really are about the performance of the machines, the CPU power that exists now that allows us to put a level of detail and a level of computing into the things we do. So high poly sculpting. Um, every, you know, working in ZBrush is generally the program that we use. And really including down to the surface detail of things, the weave and the fabric on the straps. And you know, I guess this video doesn't really allow us, you can't see it as clearly, but you know, the actual pattern of the gauze in her straps are there. And that becomes really important for the way that the programs process the data. Um, these individual uh, stitches are, are built into the gloves here. And uh, the mod all the detail is modeled in here. This is 
really actually makes the whole process more efficient. It sounds like it's more work, and in some ways it is, but it's more work applied in more effective ways. So we're using cloth simulation a lot now, where we actually build the clothing based upon the way that the panels and the patterns are actually cut, and then drape it over the, fa over the body to get effective head starts on doing folds and things like that. Typically, trying to sculpt folds from scratch is a lot of work. This is a really important, helpful tool. Physically based shading. So when I talked about the CPU power, we can now think about shading, which is drawing the objects in the world by, in a model that mimics the actual photons coming down and hitting the surfaces. Um, it's very complex, uh, but essentially the point of it is if you look up in the corner, there's the same model all in different lighting situations, and it looks good because it's done on a physically accurate way. So we used to have to make a lot of assets specific to the types of levels they were going to be in. We might have to tweak assets for dark levels and vice versa. So this makes us much more efficient, and it also makes the detail everywhere look better. There are texture painting programs now uh, out there that are able to understand all that information that we sculpted into the high poly model. So when we talked about the scratches on the edges and the grime and the cracks and things like that, if you're making that from scratch, it's actually kind of a pain in the butt to sit there and scratch every single edge forever. By the time you're about halfway through, you don't care anymore. So this gives you a great head start of putting the scratches in the right places and the grime in the right places, and then you can focus your time on tuning things up in the places that matter. It's really powerful. This is using physically based shaders, and here's some examples of the results that we're getting out of that whole uh, pipeline. And it's pretty, pretty cool, I think. I grabbed these because I thought they were really awesome. So game engines, game engines are free now. You get Unreal or Unity for free. Game engines are kind of the playground of video games. It's the whole environment in which you can build a game. It's fantastic for any area, coding, everything, but they're really great for artists. And you, know, you can build worlds in it, do particle effects, and really tune your models so that they look good in the games. Uh, this is technology that's used across a wide variety of real commercial games. So when you understand this, your skills are very applicable to real world employment. And then, of course, virtual reality and augmented reality. We're all hearing about that, and that's something that's totally new. I mean, it was started back in the 90s, but the graphics weren't there, and the hardware wasn't there, and now it is. And it's, uh, so it's like the next, when we used that example before of what old real-time 3D looked like versus now, this is the next leap that's going to happen. It's truly something that we don't even know what it's going to be, and that's very exciting to me. And, you know, virtual augmented reality, uh, the Mars landing project is really cool that's going on and it's going to be awesome. Okay, so video games need great artists. Someone has to make all the art for these games needed to populate the game. Games are an excellent opportunity to make a living as an artist. It's kind of an unprecedented time in history that there's all these art jobs out there. It's pretty great. Um, so it's a good time in a thriving industry. You get to be part of evolving technology. It's a constant chance for improvement and growth of your skills. Someone has to make all of this art. Why not you? So going back over what we covered today, the awesome is anything that is compelling, inspiring, and fun. The awesome in games is only going to increase. Liquid development is dedicated to helping make some more awesome in the world. Traditional art skills are the foundation of video game art. The software and training, uh, we talked about the software and training that, that, that there's out there to be had. How you can get started, that practice, 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 get connected, share your work. We talked about the new technologies that are making games art better and more efficiently, and that dedicated, diligent, and passionate artists are in demand in this industry. Oops. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm sure. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna need somebody to translate probably. But I don't know. Are there questions? I think he's getting a mic.
Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you say you work with Borderlands, in, I mean with Weirobox in Borderlands the Prosequel. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, we worked on all the Borderlands games. We've done art for all of the Borderlands games. My god, I love the Molly One Snipe Rifles. Really but my cool. question... Uh, we built a lot of the guns, actually. Lovely, love it. Uh, the question is, there is a place where uh, I have a friend that is an artist. Uh, sometimes he, well, she been trying to get into games. Is there any way to contact you to contact uh, yeah. your yeah. enterprise? Yeah, we talk afterwards. I'll give you my card. Okay. Yeah. Thank cool. you. Totally. And there's actually a, on the Liquid Development website. There's a jobs at Liquid Development email, and people can send portfolios in there. Ah, uh, hi. I was just in a, in a doubt that. Is this based the time limit for artwork, or the artwork is first and the time limit is in the game production itself? No, the time, the, limit's first. Time, limit too? time limit's first. There's schedules, and basically we usually have to work to a schedule. It can change depending upon what we understand the art needs to be, and things change in games all the time. It's really important because we're making entertainment. It has to be a living thing. You don't really usually start any piece of art and end up exactly where you thought you were going. You know, you make changes as you go because of what's best. But it's also big investments with a lot riding on it. So there can be times when they have to stop and say, look, we have to get it done. Alguien más? No, okay. nadie más? Great. Nadie más de hacer preguntas? We covered it all. Okay. <laughs>